Well, good morning. It's Bruce Williams, and it's Friday, so it's time for Gross Path Challenge number 18. I want to thank all my friends and colleagues for provided images for these Gross Path Challenges, either directly over the years or through online collections, which allow me to put them together. Now, go ahead and get out your, your pens and your pieces of paper. Give yourself about 60 to 90 seconds for each question and let's see what you know today question number one is from an ox i would simply like a morphologic diagnosis okay time's up on this one this is a valvular hematocyst these are common incidental findings which you will see um, they tend to decrease in size uh, with progressive age, usually largest in calves. It's a little bit of blood that gets uh, uh, caught up when the valves and the uh, myocardium are covered by a layer of endothelium. A little bit of blood gets caught up in there in some of these cracks and crevices of the valves. Um, over time, the erythrocytes will break down. You'll have sort of a yellowish color, and eventually these will sort of deflate. They usually don't cause any problem at all. This is a fairly large one. They can be red or yellow or sort of whitish, uh, same color as the surrounding valve. Valvular hematocysts. Okay, question number two is tissue from a small clawed otter. OTT or otters or, or uh, aquatic mustelids. Uh, let's see, I'm going to ask you for a morphologic diagnosis and a cause on this one. Okay, time's up. This is an unusual one. I, I think that uh, aquatic animals should be exempt from getting this particular uh, uh, condition. What we're seeing is there is a yellowish discoloration of the mesenteric, omental, and subcutaneous fat. Okay. If you were in the, uh, uh, in the necropsy room at this time, the whole place would smell like rotten fish. And the morphologic diagnosis would be a diffuse necrotizing mesenteric and subcutaneous steatitis. Okay. The cause of this is generally vitamin E deficiency in animals that have a diet of high levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids or fish. fish a fish diet tends to burn up your vitamin E quickly. And this is not uncommonly seen in uh, animals that are fed fish. It's been documented widely, uh, first seen in cats. You can see it in mink that are fed a lot of fish or fish offal. Um, you can actually even see it in uh, herons who have a high fish diet. You'd think that uh, uh, herons and, and otters that eat a lot of fish would probably be uh, somewhat immune to this disease. They naturally have lo high levels of vitamin E, but they're not. That's why so many of the fish that are fed in zoos are stuffed full of, uh, of vitamin E to make sure that these animals have an adequate dietary intake to offset the uh, unsaturated fatty acids that are in their diet. Um, this tends to be a very painful condition animals with it. If you touch them in an area, um, they will they will bite you. Um, so it's a stinky, uh, painful, and highly unnecessary disease. The disease, this disease, uh, anecdotally, um, was named by Dr. Carl Jones. Um, and I asked him one time, I said, why'd you call it necrotizing steatitis? He said, well, this other guy I was working with wanted to call it necrotizing adipocytes, and I just thought that sounded terrible, so I changed it when the book went to publish. Okay. Moving on. We have tissue from a Atlantic bottlenose dolphin, and I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause of this lesion. Okay, time's up. This, these areas here uh, represent areas of multifocal coalescing granulomatous dermatitis. And this is very interesting. Uh, fungal, uh, it's, it generally is in yeast form in the, uh, uh, in the tissues, and it only affects 
It's only been identified in dolphins and man, or humans, uh, for some reason, primarily in South America. And this is a condition, or it's a fungus, um, whose name is Lacasia loboi. And it used to be called Loboa loboi, which I thought was a lot catchier name. I don't know why they have to change all the names, but this is now Lacasia loboi, and it's a disease that uh, is seen in, in uh, uh, humans in coastal areas of South America um, as well as in cetaceans. Lacasia loboi. Oh, slide number four. Cute little piglet here. I need a morphologic diagnosis and a cause on this one, too. Okay, time's up. We see a lot of these in these gross path challenges. These are areas of epidermal proliferation, and then the largest, or excuse me, the central area or the oldest area of the lesion is necrotic. And this is a classic POC. Um, these are caused by pox or parapox viruses. And when we think about swine, it's the cause of this is going to be swine pox virus. And, and always make sure. Pox virus, um, for the terms of these exercises, is not good enough. Okay? Because if you took an avian pox virus from a rooster and you stuck it into a pig skin, it probably wouldn't grow. So not all pox viruses are the same. They're often species specific. This one is. So swocks, swocks, swine pox virus. Um, and the morphologic diagnosis is not something that you should really have to consider. They're all the same, okay? This is a proliferative and necrotizing dermatitis. The oldest and the central area of these lesions eventually succumb to the cytopathic effects of the pox virus. They multiply in the cytoplasm, and eventually the cells will rupture. Um, and then the, the, the pox virus, um, it causes a hyperplasia of the surrounding tissue because it needs more uh, cells to infect. So evolutionary, it's very efficient. And so this is classic multifocal coalescing proliferative and necrotizing dermatitis due to swine pox virus. This pox virus can be transmitted by arthropod parasites um, or by direct contact, but it can also cross the placenta. So remember, pox viruses are systemic infections. Um, the best lesions and the ones we can easily take pictures of are the ones in the skin. Some cause really severe systemic infections like smallpox in humans and sheeppox and goatpox, camelpox and uh, extramelia virus or mouse pox. The rest of them, not so much. But remember, this is a systemic infection. It can cross the placenta. And so you can see um, aborted fetuses with classic pox lesions or newborns with pox lesions. So don't forget, uh, this one, yeah, sort of a toss-up. Old enough that he could have gotten it either way. Slide number five is tissue from a goldfish. Just name the condition. Okay, time's up. I see something this big in a fish, especially a goldfish. I'm going to default to polycystic kidney, which is what this is. Um, goldfish are, are pretty well known for occasionally having polycystic kidneys. Um, this one tends to float upside down at the, the top of the tank. I don't know if the genetics are totally worked out, but it's a good animal model for this. And and uh, um, something else that you know should cross your mind if you see something like this would be maybe a hepatocellular tumor or even a thyroid tumor, because fish can often have thyroid tumors can get very large. They, the thyroid tends to be sort of diffuse organ in the area of the gills, but you can see some back here. But if it's a goldfish and I see that big thing in the abdomen, I think I'm going to go with polycystic kidney. It's a goldfish thing. Wow, there are a lot of exotics on this particular quiz. And this is an absolutely great lesion. This is tissue from a turtle, and I want you to give me the pathogenesis of this lesion. Usually pathogenesis, um, the last thing that you'll put down is the actual lesion itself, and then you'll have three or four or five keywords within the pathogenesis separated by arrows, so you don't have to write a whole paragraph here. Just give me, you know, some, some key concepts and the lesion. 
Okay, that one probably took you a little bit of time. Um, 90 seconds is a good time for most. You should be able to write most pathogenesis within about 90 seconds. Hopefully you don't have to think about them. But the lesion that we are looking at is tremendous edema of the conjunctiva as a result of squamous metaplasia of the lacrimal glands and duct obstruction. So the last thing is going to be squamous metaplasia of lacrimal glands, duct obstruction, and edema. Ooh, those are three steps. I already got three. Can you find one or two more? Well, the classic cause of this is vitamin A deficiency in the diet. Okay, so vitamin A deficiency in the diet. And what vitamin A does is it results in squamous metaplasia of a wide variety of uh, glandular epithelium. If we're dealing with a bird, and probably this turtle as well, there are mucus glands which line the esophagus. And I'll bet you a dollar to a donut that those also have undergone squamous metaplasia. You can see it in just about any glandular epithelium. And of course, the body doesn't like squamous, uh, squamous uh, epithelium or any type of keratin. So it's always, there's usually a little bit of inflammation involved too. And the classic problem with these, and I had a couple of uh, li these little turtles you could buy them in the pet store back in the days when I was a kid. You can't do it anymore because they do carry salmonella. Kids like to pop them in their mouths. I never did that, but I had two of these little uh, red-eared sliders, and you would buy them with a little plastic, uh, uh, it wasn't even a cage, eh, sort of a cage. It had a ramp. It had a plastic palm tree, and they'd give you this turtle food. And uh, every day I would faithfully uh, feed Emil and Eric. That was their names, Emil and Eric. I would faithfully feed them a couple of shakes out of this turtle food. And what the turtle food was, it was, it was nothing but dried ants. And uh, it caused a number of problems. Dried ants are high in formic acid. They're also extremely low in most vitamins. So poor Emil and Eric got, uh, they both got this condition. They were highly malnourished, and as a, as a nine-year-old, I was doing what I thought um, was right, and that's what the guy at the pet store told me that I was supposed to do, and uh, this was a real common problem back in the day. Okay. Well, slide number six. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Slide number seven. I'll try not to turn this one into all about me because uh, I don't have any stories on this one. But this is tissue from a lamb, and uh, I need a morphologic diagnosis and give me two possible causes. It's absolutely beautiful slide. They don't get any better than this one. Okay, time's up. Uh, this tissue from a lamb, and a lot of times when you get these particular lambs, they're going to be very autolytic, and, and the lesions won't be great. This is fantastic, fantastic lesion. It's probably an aborted fetus, but it could be a stillborn lamb. And we have these large multifocal to coalescing areas of targetoid necrosis, and the morphologic diagnosis is going to be multifocal to coalescing necrotizing hepatitis. Okay, some people are going to say multifocal coalescing hepatic necrosis. I'm going to take that one too. The two don't mean that much to me. I was trained many years ago that if you have an agent like a bacteria or a virus that's causing necrosis, you make it necrotizing hepatitis. And if it's anything else like a toxin or whatever, it's, it's hepatic necrosis. I realize that is a somewhat tenuous distinction. So for those of you just like hepatic necrosis, I'm down with that too. Two possible causes. The classic cause of this is Campylobacter fetus variant fetus. Bacterial disease is generally picked up in sheep by ingestion or contact with uh, aborted fetuses, membranes, something that, that has this, and it's often uh, contained within the, uh, uh, within the flock between lambings as an a inapparent infection. Um, in, in cattle, it can also be transmitted venereal disease. Uh, venereally uh, during coitus, so, uh, but not in sheep. So Campylobacter fetus, variant fetus, is a classic cause of this particular agent. People said that you can see it with other forms of Campylobacter, like Campylobacter jejuni as well. 
coli. I'm not going to take uh, any issue with that. But in a testing situation, I'm going to put down the one that's in all the textbooks. And fetus fetus is the one that I like. The other one that's a newcomer on the scene, I don't know much about this one, but I know enough to add it because it, it pops up whenever we're listing causes for this lesion, is Flexispira rapini. R-A-P-P-I-N-I, Flexispira rapini. I like the way that sounds. Um, so those are two possible causes. Nothing else looks like this in a stillborn weak lamb or an abortus. Slide number eight is tissue from a cat in a morphologic diagnosis. Give yourself 10 seconds for this one. Okay, time is up. This one is such a classic. It's a cat. And when you open up the, the skull cap of a cat, 80 to 90 percent of the tumors you're going to see are meningiomas, and that's what this is. Okay, what type of meningioma? Uh, I don't know. I don't really care at this point. It, grossly, it's a meningioma, and probably gave this cat a heck of a headache. But uh, you know, we we like to subclassify meningiomas uh, microscopically. I don't know what the, if there's any prognostic difference with any of them, but they all have great names like somomatous and meningo endotheliomatous and and all that, but meningioma to, is a meningioma to me, and I'm always happy to tell somebody they have a meningioma rather than the other options that you can, that can pop up in and around the brain. So, cats, meningiomas. Okay, be careful, no more scary with this next picture, but this is slide number nine. It is tissue from a dog. And I'm going to tell you what breed of dog this is. This is, for those of you who've never seen this, this is a whippet. They're known as bully whippets. And people breed these monsters and they sell them. Um, bully whippet. It looks like a pit bull to me. But uh, so I would like the cause of this lesion. Okay. Well, don't take too much because either you know it or you don't. I don't believe in the spontaneous generation of knowledge. But if you know anything about Belgian blue cattle, um, so we would call them doppelgangers or double-muscled animals. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. This is not a form of, of – there are some forms of muscular dystrophy, especially dystrophin-type muscular dystrophies, which – Dogs will get you know tremendous muscling, but that's not what's going on here. This is more akin to the Belgian blue issue, and this is a uh, inactivation of the gene um, of myostatin. And myostatin is the gene that that causes the muscles to stop growing. You know something has to tell me your muscles are big enough and uh, need to stop growing. That's called myostatin. And these animals have a, uh, a defective gene product of that, so their muscles continue to grow. Um, this could be a real problem. I would never buy a dog like this because it's like a weightlifter in the uh, gym. Okay, they spend all this time pumping up their muscles and pumping up their muscles, and uh, they tend to get injured a lot because you can cause muscular hypertrophy, but nothing tells the the blood vessels that supply them, the connective tissue that supports them, there's nothing that causes an increase in their size as well. So you end up with these big muscles just rife for being torn or injured or something like that. So uh, be fit, be healthy, um, don't be a big muscle-bound bully whippet. And our last slide is a classic presentation and this is actually from a goat it could be a dog it could be a cat um, what I would like for you to do is give me a morphologic diagnosis okay time's up on this last slide and Dr. Ken McEntee years ago wrote a book back in the 50s and 60s, I forget. I think it's 1960, and it's not in print any longer, but it's a fantastic book. He was one of the first people that, he was interested in reproductive veterinary pathology, one of the first people that really took a good look at these intersexes, and he laid them out all the same. And the gonads are always at one side, then you can see the bladder, it's always sticking up, the external genitalia is here, and then we have the reproductive tract. 
and the intersects is you could simply say intersects but I'm not gonna give you full credit because I want you to know know the naming conventions and the naming conventions here basically if you look at the gonads and the gonads are male then this would be a male and then if you look at their ovaries they'd be female and then you compare them to the external genitalia you don't need to really worry about everything in the middle but look at the external genitalia okay if they don't match up we're dealing with a pseudo hermaphrodite so this is actually we're looking at a sort of rudimentary vulva a very short vaginal vault a rudimentary uterus and two large testes hanging off of it so this is would be known as a male pseudo hermaphrodite if it was a if we saw ovaries and male genitalia rudimentary male genitalia would be a female pseudo hermaphrodite and the true hermaphrodites can be very difficult to identify grossly because with true hermaphrodites, you generally tend to have an ovotestis, and they, they're not easily identifiable as to one or the other, or they may look like one and have um, both you know, germ cells and, and supporting tissues, uh, sex cord, stroma, for both in the testis. But whenever I see this, this particular layout, I know immediately it's going to be a pseudo-hermaphrodite, and then it's simply a matter of me looking and making sure what type of gonad we have. So male pseudohermaphrodite in goats. Goats are highly overrepresented with intersex is probably the most common. You also see it in certain breeds of dogs like schnauzers, um, but you can see it in just about any breed. You see it in horses, not uncommonly. Um, so male pseudohermaphrodite and a classic, you should just, someone throws this slide up there, you can look at the way the tissues lay and say, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do with that one. Okay, well, that's 10 slides, uh, and we will see you next week with another Gross Path Challenge. Have a fantastic weekend, y'all.